Good morning. I got it. We're good. Welcome everyone um, to the 2023 RMP annual meeting. I'm excited to see so many faces in the audience today. Um, I'd like to start with a, to offer, I would like to start by offering a land acknowledgement that was developed through the collaborative efforts of the original native people, peoples of the San Francisco Bay. The San Francisco Estuary Institute and most of the stakeholders of the regional monitoring program located throughout the SF Bay reside on the ancestral territory of the native peoples of the San Francisco Bay, including the numerous villages and tribes of the Ohlone, Patwin, Coast, Coast Miwok, and Bay Miwok. We recognize that through a violent history of colonization and dispossession, today as guests, we benefit from living and working on the traditional homeland of these native people. We wish to show our respect to them and their ancestors by acknowledging the injustices inherent to this history and by affirming their sovereign rights and their current efforts to achieve restorative justice. A couple housekeeping items. We are hosting in a hybrid format today. It is important to note that we here in person will not be able to hear or see the virtual audience, so we have a dedicated person to monitor the Zoom um, webinar through the chat box. So for those joining us virtually, please update your name with your affiliation. We do not, or we do want participation from our virtual audience, so please use the chat function if you have a comment, question, or technical issue. The Zoom moderator will repeat or voice the questions from our virtual audience for the speaker or the panel. For those of us in person here today, while we may be able to hear each other across the room, the virtual audience will not be able to hear anything that is not spoken directly into a microphone. So please wait um, if you have a question until one of our mic runners brings you a microphone or speak uh, to speak into so that our virtual audience can hear the question or comment. And now I think I'll turn it over to Tom. Welcome, Tom. Thank you, Amy, and welcome everybody. Oh. What? What? Yeah, I don't know quite. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Thank you. And uh, as, as you know, this is a great pleasure for me to be able to, to, to sort of be your MC, to at least to start things off. But since I'm a, a speaker today, I'm not going to go get, get into a story or anything about embracing you. I think that the, the agenda speaks for itself. We're gonna do some reflection on how we got to where we're at and where we're going in the first session. And we are going to uh, then focus in our key areas that we're attending to these days, nutrients, sediment, uh, particular focus on PFAS and then other emerging contaminants. But the one thing I will say is I, 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 this is, I've been fortunate to attend, or at least partly attend, the three key legs of the tryout of events that happened in the, in the Bay Area every October, because there's hardly strictly bluegrass, <laughs> and then there's the Fleet Week Air Show, and then there's the RMP Annual Meeting. So, <laughs> so. So let's, let's get the show on the road. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Karen North. I'm the vice chair for the steering committee. Um, I've had the pleasure of, you know, kicking Tom under the table to try and keep him in check with time for about a decade or plus. 
So good luck to me moderating this session. Um, we're very fortunate to have Tom Mumley with his years of experience. Uh, little things that you probably don't know about him is that he's really active in Boy Scouts and he still hikes like a machine. So uh, kudos to him. And Amy is also here, as many of you guys have known. We're very fortunate to have her. She, I met her years ago when she was a USGS. And so um, then she did a little stint. She tried teaching. Her passion is really tennis. So if you guys want to learn how to play tennis, you know, maybe she'll do some side lessons. So anyway, I'm just going to move it over because I don't want to take any of Tom and Amy's time. So on to you. Well, a, a key thing to note is that we built into this session a, a good block of time after I talk and Amy talks to have a Q&A dialogue with you all. Hopefully we have, it's engaging opportunity to get your as, as questions, we get your input on on the reflections of how, where we're at and where we're going with the R and P, uh, and you know if if we don't have enough things to talk about, we can break early. But I I doubt that would be the case. There we go. So uh, basically, I as you know, I I have a long history uh, associated with the R and P. Was there as part of the the development of the efforts that preceded it and then have a role, ongoing role, one form or another for quite a few years, 30 plus. So I'm going to give you a, 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 basically a reflection of those years and I was thinking about that I, there's so much to say and so it can't be a walking tour. It's going to have to be a drive-by, but then I, I cringe when I use that term drive-by because driving associates uh, being in an automobile, which is uh, the human's best created form of generating pollutants and distributing them throughout, throughout our, our watersheds, whether it be through emissions or brake pad wear or tire wear. So we're going to, rather than being on a conventional vehicle, we're going to, the tour is going to be on a magic bus, which it doesn't pollute. It just, it just get, allows us to go, go through things. So I'm going to put my tour hat on and let's get going. So I want to, First, I'm going to start with what what created the RP. What was the impetus? And it all started in 1986. It was the summer of 86 when our board had adopted amendments to the basin plan establishing water quality objectives based on federal criteria for bay waters. A key issue that came up during that dialogue, an intense dialogue, was potential challenges for compliance with inevitable effluent limitations and and here we are establishing water quality objectives for the bay with no information as to what are the levels of these contaminants of interest in the bay. So uh, that was a challenge. And as an outgrowth of that dialogue, you'll see that we the board made two decisions. One is to not apply the objectives to the lower South Bay, south of the Dumbarton Bridge because of unique circumstances, which is consequential effluent limits on the wastewater discharges. And then, uh, and then also copper throughout the bay was probably going to be problematic. Uh, bear, mind you, our basin plan had uh, directives for effluent limits where essentially if you're a shallow water discharge, you get no dilution credit. So basically you would have to meet, meet your limit would be the water quality objective. If you're a deep water discharge, you would get a maximum of 10 to 1 dilution credit. So you could just take the water quality objective, multiply it by 10 and say, oops, that might be a problem. It, so that, that created some, some aches. So the next thing in the story was, fortunately, soon there, or not for, first I should say, Mike Carlin and I joined the planning group like in 1987 to 88. And we, you know, I give credit to Mike because he kind of took the lead first, but he engaged me. Like he tapped Russ Flagel at UC Santa Cruz who had an NSF grant who was interested in applying his new clean water, you know, uh, blue water chemistry, ultra clean techniques for measuring metals in water. And we're talking at the parts per trillion level, whereas our water quality objectives are at the parts per billion level. So basically it allows us to get great certainty on, the, on, the, on those values. But what it turns out that Mike in work that he was doing and work I was doing, we had some access to contract resources that added up to $100,000. So we, we had a $100,000 contract with Mike, with, with Russ on top of his NSF work, and that enabled us to do the first uh, monitoring of these metals throughout the Bay. So this is actually from the report. No, for young people, know how, look, this is how the superior our graphic capabilities were back then. 
uh, but just shows you, shows you the distribution of stations and it's showing cop the copper results, dissolved copper results, and actually where I wrote the line for the federal number being 3.1, you can see the lower South Bay to the left is they're, they're above that, but in the North Bay, which is to the right, they approach that, and if you use that 10 to 1 factor, you can see how uh, there could be some problematic effort limits if we were to apply those objectives strictly. So that was the beginning. And then the next thing that fortunately happened, it happened to it surprise us, but there was legislation that happened in the summer of 1989 that created the Bay Protection Toxic Cleanup Program. And actually not only created it, say telling the water board that you had to establish sediment water quality objectives and you had to take action to identify and clean up hotspots. There was some money, $5 million came with it. And I got drafted to go to write the, the budget plan and the program plan for that program. And I had this clever idea that if we're going to be able to, to identify toxic hotspots and to establish sediment quality objectives, we need to have information about our water body. So I built into the program the need to pilot a regional monitoring program and the obvious place to pilot it was the San Francisco Bay region. So we've got, we're able to get several hundred thousand dollars as a result of that. That uh, And very importantly, also got a staff person, Karen Taberski. As many of you know, she was a key player from the water board who you know, working with on the RP. So you can see here to the left, there's a report that we generated as a result of that work. And note, by the way, now, some of you know who Jesse Lacey with USGS. She's one of our collaborators, but she also was a regional water board employee and during this period of time. So again, more you know, this was all about building pilot, the pilot R and P. Uh, in addition to that, there was still some institutional stuff, political stuff that had to deal with. And this is where Steve Ritchie really came in. I mean, he was the senior who took on that basin plan amendment, but then in 88, he became the executive officer and he started doing the politicking and going to the dischargers saying, this is going to be in your interest, but we're building this, this regional monetary program and you're going to pay for it. And but one of the things we need to do is have an institutional home. Up to that point, there was the Aquatic uh, Habitat Institute, but it was frankly on life support because it had no sustained funding. But coincident with development of the RMP pilot RMP, we had the San Francisco Estuary project, which was bringing managers and scientists together. And as part of developing that comprehensive plan, we need to have a research and science program. And it's a, an obvious opportunity to wire our development of the regional monitoring pro program into it and literally have these two actions that say we need and we need an institute, a science institute to inform provide science to inform management of the estuary and specifically we need a regional monitoring program. So that all led to what happened in 1992. We brought to the board a resolution to embrace what we've done and get the board to direct us to use authorities to require dischargers to monitor the far field effects, if you will, of their discharges, but allow them to do it through a collaborative effort. And it's all a setup, of course, because we had the Estuary Institute ready. Who wants to collaborate? Send your resources our way into the proverbial, the rest is history. So let's jump ahead. I got to get the, the ball rolling here. 1997 is a key checkpoint because as part of development of the RP and, and part of developing the spirit of trust and uh, in doing things right, we built into it hardwired that we'd, we'd periodically bring external advisors in to review the program, to evaluate its, its integrity, et cetera. In 1997, we, we convened that external group and some key things, one key thing they said is, although we had a good foundation for the, the design of the regional monitoring program, but they said we should have more specific objectives that address specific management questions. So you can see I've listed some of them here, particularly about understanding the status and trends, but then be able to compare results with appropriate thresholds and also to better understand where are these contaminants coming from. So that, that led to a substantial reconsideration of the regional monitoring program in 2002, where we took the, all the information that we've been developing up to that point and went from a a fixed station, sort of deterministic approach to a probabilistic approach. The left hand photograph shows you that. We also kind of uh, reconfigure the, how we define the bay embayments relative to representative data. 
So that was the first of a series of efforts through time. This is a flyby, by the way. Uh, we did it through the years as needed. We, and beyond just having external advisors telling us to do this because we started embracing having external advisors being part of the RMP family on an ongoing basis, we on our own initiative periodically reviewed the status and trends program, always asking ourselves, are we getting optimum use of our monitoring dollars relative to answering our questions? And particularly, can we pull back on certain things to be able to afford to do new things? particularly as there was a growing interest in the 2000s to do more special studies to understand some of these complex source pathways and loadings and fate of contaminants in the asteroids. So we did a series of these adaptations. W, by the way, up there, if you're reading it, that's water. So we went from three times a year to do water cruises to one time a year. And that was actually just during dry weather because we based on all the data we corrected previously, the dry season was the most relevant. But then, by the way, at the bottom here, the CCs based redesign, we're actually going back to pil he's piloting wet weather because we have to re reconsider that question. So it's just a reflection of how we, we don't, it's not one and done. Uh, the RMP has, has and always will be dynamic. Another outgrowth I said of that review was, get more attention to sources, sources. So that gave us cause to convene as, as well as other groups. But one of the first and long lasted lasting group is the sources, pathways and loanings work group. And I bring this up because that was Ben, that was my sandbox that I played in because I had been working on the development of the urban runoff program at the water board. And, and, and this has been a lot of fun. And I got a shout out to uh, Lester McKee, who is one of the key leaders of that. And also shout out to, to Alicia Galbraith, who is now the, the lead scientist for the program that and long standing presence. And we've had a lot of fun. We've made a lot of progress through the years. Some of the key successes I illustrate here, a lot of attention, uh, put a lot of focus on understanding the Guadalupe River because that's a significant source of mercury to the bay, but we also use intensive understanding of that watershed to extrapolate uh, understanding of other watersheds in the system. And we put, you can see, we put more focus into modeling as the program matured. And right now we're actively engaged in a development of an integrated modeling and mo modeling and monitoring approach. And, uh, okay. Next step is we started making decisions based, the water board started making decisions based on the regional monitoring program. And I mean, the first very monumental uh, game changing decision was in 2020, 2002, when the board adopted site specific objectives for copper and nickel in the lower South Bay. I got to get shout out to San Jose because this didn't happen strictly on the on RNP funding. San Jose actually put $3 million on the table to facilitate uh, consideration of what may be a TMDL for copper in the lower South Bay. But part of that was established. What is the what is the target that we want to design the the, the TMDL to achieve, and it gave us cause to evaluate appropriate endpoints, which logically led to demonstrating site-specific objectives of copper that would be still protective of beneficial uses in the system. But as part of the cell to get that across the finish line, because there were some angst about we're going the board would be allowing degradation of the bay if it raised the bar to this higher level. Uh, it was the site-specific objective was 6.9 compared to the federal number of 3.1. But we said, no, it doesn't stop there. One is we have an action plan built in the basin plan amendment, challenging the municipal, the wastewater folks and the urban stormwater folks to effectively manage sources of copper. I mean, by the way, that, you know, a side story would be the evolution, the development, the identification of copper in brake pads and the brake pad partnership sort of grew out of this and it was strongly supported by our ability to show those, that industry, that copper was a problem in the Bay because we had this robust data set. But the key were these action triggers. The first level was a statistically derived level that, in other words, if we hit this level, that means it's statistically higher than current conditions. So there would be an indication that degradation might be happening and would cause action. Well, here's the, the good point is we've been monitoring copper ever since. And we do a three year average comparison with the target with the triggers and you can see here from the 2011 13 and 15 average we're well below those those uh, action levels and way, way below the actual water quality objectives. 
Another thing we do, I said, we also do these extra studies. There was one of the uncertainties associated with copper was that outgrowth of, of studies that were going on up in the Puget Sound that associated copper with affecting the olfactory centers of salmodids. So we actually, RMP did a study on that and demonstrated that that wasn't uh, a reason to be concerned in the Bay Area. So it, again, enable us to make decisions based on the information we have at hand. It's fundamental to how we do business. We, we don't have to have answers to all the questions. We're willing to take action because we have the RMP available to demonstrate whether our actions are effective enough and address uncertainties that may be uh, a, con a concern as part of those initial decisions. So that prevailed in all the subsequent decisions that the board has made since then. In 2004, we brought the, the San Francisco Bay Mercury TMDL and they are found in a lot of, of work that the RMP had done, including helping us do a fish consumption study and enable us to, to establish uh, levels of a mercury in fish that would be protected of consumers of fish, as well as establishing a bird egg target. Jay Davis had something to do with that because of his, his research and interest in promoting using bird eggs as a good indicator of, of things in the region, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the key is this last step here that we had. We are able to make a decision faced with uncertainty because we built into the implementation plan the need to remedy, resolve some of those uncertainties or conf confirm the appropriateness of the hypothesis that we used to, to make the board decision. Unfortunately, there was a bit of a glitch that gave cause for the state board to remand it back, and it, it, it gave us cause to actually do some refinements of the TMDL, but the main change was because we didn't actually establish a water quality objective for that fish tissue level, uh, but we still had this water column number in the bay, uh, the EPA actually challenged us saying your TMDL is not going to attain that water column number, therefore we can't approve it. So state board, as a result of that, remanded it back. So I said, okay, we will actually establish a water quality objective that uh, for, for mercury in the fish tissue, and we got rid of that archaic uh, uh, water column number. So we did similarly with the San Francisco Bay PCBs TMDL. Uh, you'll see the bullets are very comparable to the to the other, but you know, there, again, there's a lot of information uh, made available through the RNP. One key thing I added on there is food web model, and that we've had the benefit, long-standing benefit of of participation by Dr. Frank Gobus, who's with Simon Fraser. University of Fraser in Vancouver, and he's still with us. And but we had a foundational food web model associating the presence of PCBs in sediment with levels in fish that's still quite valid to this day. Although I can say we're currently reviewing that as part of adaptive um, improvements to the system. Again, we, we had a number of need to do implementation related studies to help inform how we implement the TMDL and possibly improve the, through that. So that gave us cause to enter into the generation of strategies. So you see 2007, that was sort of after the, the Mercury TMDL had been established, but the Mercury TMDL did instigate a lot of interest in doing Mercury related studies. But at, at that point though, we have sort of a free for all, if you will, we just get proposals from um, our academic partners and, and, and our other partners. And, it, and Jay is quite familiar with this because we had a dialogue about this and we had to say, we can't, we, we can't afford to do it this way. Let's put forward our thinking about what are our critical needs. Let's establish what we call the strategy that laid out the, uh, what our needs are and then ask for proposals to meet our needs. So that was the first of again became a series of strategies that we've developed as I, I've listed here. And uh, in, right down to the bottom one is one we're actively working on now is how do we optimize uh, resources toward uh, applying it to modeling in conjunction with our monitoring efforts. Uh, another outgrowth of this concept is we had these individual strategies or even multi-year work plans by our various work groups, but then we, on an annual basis, we try to decide which of these projects are the best for the forthcoming year. And in 2012, again, dialogue that Jay and I had, so we, we need to take a step back and think multi-year. So starting in 20, 
2012, we, are, we convene an annual multi-year planning workshop where we bring together both the technical review committee members and the steering committee members to and our work group and strategy leads and, and look through what is what do all the groups have in mind and in what year and we set priorities for not only the first year but subsequent years and we've adaptively improved that process ever since key fundamental way of how we're efficient how we do things one of the key strategies that I've been, I'm gonna talk about because I've been passionately involved is the emerging contaminant one. So, so you wanna read about emerging contaminants in 20, this, this pulse in 2013 is still quite relevant, although we've made a lot of progress since, but it's, it really shows you how much we had already done by 2013 upon establishing the strategy. And we've come a long way since then. But I wanna shout out to something that we did in a very pioneering fashion uh, I, I, this is this is somewhat jargon for those of you who are not familiar with chemistry, but there, there's the concept of targeted and non-target analysis. Target analysis is you go to the, tell the chemist, tell me if this particular chemical is in this sample. And a lot of times, especially if it's a trace organic or hydrocarbons, you get these chromatographs with all these other peaks, but they the chemists can focus in on quantifying the actual specific chemical you ask for them. But there's all this other stuff there. Well, Daniel Oros, who is a smart chemist working at the Institute, he took on this project where he actually mined these chromatographs from the past work that Bob Riseborough, I meant to call him out earlier, Bob, Bob Riseborough was but a key pioneer uh, partner from UC Berkeley. So Daniel mined those, those those chromatographs. So it was sort of a precursor, if you will, to non-target analysis and identified there is a bunch of stuff that we should be interested in that helped feed into the, uh, the targeting and non-targeting efforts from here on in our emerging cannabis program. I'm gonna talk a bit now about funding and how partnerships, uh, the, ability, the benefit of partnering has created more money and resources to help us do more better. And emerging contaminants, good story here because this just shows you the overall uh, growth of the RNP over the years, currently about four and a half million. But uh, we've been doing CCs for about 15 years. We started out nominally maybe spending 100,000 of our spiral and special projects funds, about a third of the budget they, we, they compete for with everything else, sources, pathways and loadings, PCBs, mercury, a lot of other stuff. You can see it's grown to now $800,000. It's become a, a significant major part of our R&P. I previously noted, I'm not gonna explain it more today now, that we also reviewed and have adapted the status and trends program to be more CC centric, including, you know, and so that's reflected about this. But where, you know, notice in the yellow, and there, there, there's two things. One on the right, that the Bay Area wastewater agencies contribute uh, nearly 200, uh, 340 is what it is now. And this past year, we actually have a similar uh, support coming, a, a, you know, a similar report coming from the municipal stormwater folks. We built that into the municipal stormwater permit, and I'll explain where the uh, later where the. POTW money came from. But you're just going to, on a flash here, and we're talking about, you know, we're flying by here. This is a culmination of all our work is summarized in this one graph, one, one visual aid. We built this framework that's consistent with external advisors to the state board on how to go about doing emerging contaminant monitoring and making a risk based approach. And so we've adapted this and we've improved it over the years. About, and you can see here the number of contaminants that we've looked at and putting in these various bins. And uh, organophosphate esters, by the way, those are all, uh, flame retardants, which, which emerge to replace the brominated flame retardants. And, uh, and they're, also, they're also in plastic. So there are a lot of them and they're certainly of interest. So in a phosphated surfactants, those are detergents, both industrial and even home use, et cetera. I'm not gonna walk you through all this, but I wanna call attention to this one, PBDEs, polybrominated diphenyl ethers, and the compound next to it is another brominated flame retardant that actually has been phased out along with PBDEs. And what I wanna show you here is the success story that we get to, this, to tell because of the RNP. Because of our monitoring of PBDEs, we're actually be able to show the recovery. Uh, and this is using uh, Shiner Surf Perch as the indicator and you see how much that, that's dropped over time. The counter to this is 
back in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, Naomi Fager and I, you know, Naomi, some of you know, was, a, was led the planning group. We considered recommending that we list the bay for PVDEs based on anti-degradation. We didn't have a threshold to compare it to, but we had this growing body of evidence through the RP that levels are getting progressively higher and higher. And we, are we gonna create the new PCB dilemma where we've got so much uh, of this material in the bay, it'll take decades. Yeah, so, okay, moving on. I just wanna just quickly explain this, the, where some of the additional resources come from. Uh, alternative monitoring requirements. We actually had a dialogue with our, our municipal partners and we noticed that they, we knew that they spent a lot of money on mandatory monitoring in their permits for what I'd call archaic pollutants. So we took a close look at what can we get, get away, what can we eliminate and still, still agree with uh, regulatory requirements. As an outgrowth of that, we made it a volunteer program to start, but the condition was, and I love being part of this, we're going to, good news is we're going to let you save money and not monitor, so you spend money monitoring certain compounds, but the condition is those savings have to go to CECs. And fortunately, that was not a hard sell. And uh, as you can see, uh, uh, quite a few of the municipalities agreed to do that, and we generated $270,000 a year uh, to, to reflect that. We then subsequently followed up with that because uh, to make it something more permanent, we actually did amendment to all these permits and say it's no longer voluntary. You have to do CEC's monitoring, but you can do it through contributing to the RMP. And that also then, and, and those funds will grow adaptively with other, as we do cost of living and other increases to the RMP. So that's why I'm showing when you first did it, it added up to about three, 320,000. It's already now at 340,000. So I don't have time to tell you about these part. These are uh, additional tours that cost more time, not money, but we can do tours later, but clearly a lot of emphasis these days on nutrients, sediment, and microplastics, in addition to what I've emphasized about sources, pathways, and loadings, uh, and uh, emerging contaminants. A couple things I want to call out just relative to those drivers is, one, a shout out to our USGS partners who have been key to our success. We fund or complement funding that they have for research in the Bay. And, and there's two things up here. Upper left is Dave Schulhammer's work and his team monitored, continuously monitoring suspended sediment in different spots in the Bay. And I think this particular one, I can't even see from reading it. Where is that one? Anyway, it doesn't matter. But you can see there's that line down the middle where we're able to show because of the robust data set, a significant change in suspended sediment levels in the Bay. Uh, you can, uh, you know, the hypothesis that I have is that's an outgrowth of the dams in the, in the Sierra, uh, all the water, the big watershed. It took a while for holding back all that sediment to result in showing levels changing in the bay. But that was a major finding, less sediment in the bay. Might that have an effect on nutrients? Because the, one reason the bay is very resilient to nutrients is it's very turbid, getting less turbid. The lower right is Jim Clern and his group's work on focusing on nutrient related monitoring decades worth of monitoring also indicated a, a change started happening we're seeing more chlorophyll in the system. Um, I, the, the, actually that graph continues from initial work that we've been investing in and fortunately it doesn't keep rising it's stabilized, but there was a change also indicating the bay may be losing its resilience to to nutrients both fed into the creation and ongoing efforts to on our nutrient management strategy. <clears throat> and in talking about nutrients, another shout out about outgrowth of the partnership and collaborative joint fact finding that the RNP has inspired is when the nutrient issue emerged, clearly is gonna have a significant impact possibly on development of permit requirements that could be very costly for, for a Bay Area municipality. So they, they knew that and they're willing to step up and make sure we have the best science available if we're gonna make decisions that are gonna require nutrient load reductions. Let's make sure we know what we're doing. And so it's now evolved to the, the Bay Area Clean Water Agencies and all which represent all the Bay Area POWs have been contributing most recently $2.2 million a year. That's on top of what their nearly $2 million contribution to the RNP is. Just shows you what we've been able to accomplish through creating this collaborative joint fact-finding approach. Uh, one more thing on funding before I wrap. Uh, 
I remember this is something Trish Movie kept pushing me on for years. Tom, you got to be able, we got to be able to, to direct supplemental environmental projects which come from settlement of enforcement actions by the water board that the board can allow uh, up to up some of those monies to go to a local project rather than just be a penalty. But th there are constraints by the state board on what could be qualified for a supplemental environmental project. But when they did the policy revision and update in 2017, we proactively engaged and got our foot in the door and the board, the state board entertain ability for regional monitoring programs have had well-founded programs which would use study use funds to generate data that actually would inform actions so that's the benefit we had with the rmp we weren't just going to study for study's sake we could say with confidence that we will deliver these studies will affect solutions so we we got our foot in the door uh, the state board approved it and since then we've been able to realize almost four million dollars of additional funding um, and there's a bit here, but this is a pie chart that will show up in the, in the it shows up in our multi-year plan, which illustrates the distribution of, of special study funds. But you can see there's like 25% is in a bonus associated with the, uh, with supplemental environmental projects. <clears throat> so I'm going to finish with a couple of philosophical points. One is I, I used the term earlier, but I mean, this is foundational to how we do business in the regional monitoring program. When this, this is extracted from this report that, came, that got published while we had already started our TMDL program. We had already started joint fact finding, collaborative based monitoring. We've already established the ability by the, to have our board make decisions faced with uncertainty because we will take the best information we have available, make decisions, but include in the implementation of that decision adaptive improvements to how those decisions affect implementation or if need be, review and improve the basis of the decision. So it's this concept of applying sci the scientific method to decision-making is our bread and butter. And I, I, I preach this, is that basically we formulate, we gather information regarding the regulatory drivers and boundary conditions, our state of science, and what are the political factors and formulate hypotheses that are actually our decisions. So this illustrates it. This is what we do through the RP and what the RP provides. It's clearly the basis of getting the best scientific information we have. I could say personally, with confidence, it's not just me. We have this, this is the attitude at the water board that we look at our responsibility to use our regulations wisely. And it's not black, it's not an exact science like what is the number of, what's the level of a particular contaminant that fully protects a beneficial use. There's there's room to move within the regulatory platform, but it's based on good science. And then good science and smart regulation still has to be um, adapt to the political factors that affect it, social, political, and economic stuff. But we have, because of the RMP, though, this solid foundation that allows us to collaborate and have trust, which allows the board to be progressive in how it uses its regulatory authority. That's what we have done, that's what we are doing, and that's what we're going to continue doing. And, and frankly, this is, I'm going to say this really personally, and I'm going to take my tour hat off and put my talk to you personally now. It's been a lot of fun, and there's a lot more to come. Give me a second here. A lot of you have heard me that I am made the decision to retire, but, but I, but, I, but I also preach, you know, you know I, I like the idea of, of applying the scientific method to decision making. So I've decided, but I haven't decided when. So now I'm developing my, I'm developing my strategy, my strat, my strategy, because I want to leave, I want to leave in good standing, but I'm not, I'm not leaving because I, I love this work. So if you're willing, and I have an inclination, you will, it'll be my privilege and pleasure to participate in the RMP for as long as you'll have me as directly or as an advisor, you know, because I want to have more fun and have fun with you. So thank you so much.
so we actually kept Tom on time. Amazing. So we're going to have plenty of Q&A. Um, you're right on time. So the next, we have Amy to come up and give RMP highlights. And then after that, we're going to have Jay join us and we're going to do a moderated discussion. So get your questions going right now, okay? And of course, Tom is always going to be part of the RMP. Uh, good morning, and uh, I'm excited to be here. This is my very first RMP annual meeting, uh, so I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum as Tom here, and I'm going to be sharing uh, with you all today some of the highlights of my first year um, at the RMP. Um, so I want to start by introducing some new faces to the RMP, starting with me. Um, <laughs> I joined the RMP in January as the newest um, RMP manager. A little bit about my background, I'm a marine biologist and earned my master's degree at San Francisco State University. And I see my advisor here in the audience today. Hi, Francis, nice to see you. Um, I spent 10 years at the USGS working on a range of different projects in San Francisco Bay. I started there with Jan Thompson working on benthic community dynamics. I also had opportunities to work with Jim Clern on water quality, Sam Luoma looking at metal contaminants, and I spent the latter part of my time at the USGS working for Robin Stewart developing a method for measuring selenium in small sample masses. I spent seven years prior to joining SFEI teaching high school science at Sacred Heart Cathedral Preparatory in San Francisco. But now I'm just very happy to be part of the RMP and being able to utilize and expand upon all the past experience I had working in San Francisco Bay. Another new face to the RMP is Pedro. Pedro also joined SFEI in January. Pedro earned his PhD in civil engineering from the University of New Hampshire and is a licensed civil engineer. Pedro lives and works from Indianapolis, Indiana and spends time outside of work teaching his two and a half year old son uh, all about soccer. He also shared with me that uh, a few years ago he was able to, in a single day, swim in both the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. Um, so we're excited that he was able to join us today here for the annual meeting. So if you see Pedro, please take advantage of this opportunity to speak with him in person. Maybe you can ask him about how he managed to pull that swimming feet off. Um, but please take an opportunity to speak with Pedro. Next up is Jennifer. Jennifer joined SFEI in April. She earned her PhD in environmental engineering and science from Stanford, where her research focused on the fate and transport of emerging contaminants in aquatic systems uh, affected by, or impacted, excuse me, by septic systems. Some of the RMP projects she has been working on since starting at SFEI include ethoxylated surfactants and doing some site reconnaissance for our remote samplers that we will be piloting, piloting this upcoming wet season. Jennifer is not able to be with us in person today as she is currently working remotely from Mysore, India, where she's living a nocturnal vampire-like lifestyle for the month of October, so it's very spooky. Uh, but she's probably joining us virtually um, and I hope you get an opportunity to meet her in the future. Uh, Kaylee Patterson joined SFEI in May after moving to the Bay Area from South, uh, Charleston, South Carolina. She graduated from the College of Charleston in 2022 with an MS and MPA. Her research there focused on microplastics in stormwater. Fun fact about Kaylee, she was once bitten by a shark and lived to tell about it. All right, Kaylee is with us here today. There's Kaylee. So if you have a chance, you can ask her about that shark bite. We have had some changes to the RMP's technical review committee this year. The technical review committee is a formal stakeholder body structured to represent the program participant groups. The TRC provides oversight of the technical content and quality of scientific investigations conducted for the RMP and serves as an advisory body. We want to thank you and Mary Lou and Tessa for their participation on the TRC. They have decided it was time to move on, although Tessa continues to be a representative on the steering committee. And I want to welcome Jamie, Alicia, and Samantha as new representatives to the TRC. In April, we welcomed Dr. Barbara Beckingham, Associate Professor of Environmental Geosciences at the College of Charleston, as an expert advisor to the Microplastics Workgroup. 
The work groups and strategy teams serve as the basis of the bottom-up planning process by developing long-term RMP study plans that address high priority topics. Work group meetings are held every spring to plan upcoming work. And we had a very successful work group season this year. There was an emphasis on coordination between work groups, emerging contaminants and work groups and sources, pathways and loadings work groups both held two day meetings that overlapped for one day. And so both there were per, that included participants then from both work groups and they were they shared how they planned to work collaboratively on future product projects. In June, the technical review committee recommended the approval of 15 special studies projects for 2024, which then the steering committee approved in August. The steering committee is also a formal stakeholder body and is the decision making body for the RMP. A few, a few of these approved special studies that relate to presentations you will see later today include stormwater CECs monitoring and modeling for 2024, the piloting and development of a remote sampler and tire and roadway contaminants in the wet season bay water. This year, the work groups have been making progress on updates to their strategies, and this is going to lead to a major update in the multi-year plan for 2024. Oops. In June, the RMP launched a new and improved RMP webpage. We encourage you to check it out. You can find recent publications, meeting summaries, access CD3, which is the contaminant data display and download tool, the primary tool for accessing and downloading the RMP's long-term data set and other project data. The rest of my presentation is going to be highlighting some of the activities for the Status and Trends Monitoring Program. Status and Trends Monitoring makes up about a third of the RMP's overall budget, with another third of the budget going to special studies, and the remaining third going to things like program management, reporting, communications, this meeting, basically all that is needed to run the program. The Status and Trends Program concluded its 30th year, and a lot of monitoring happened this year. Selenium and sturgeon had been delayed in 2022, but we were able to collect those samples earlier this year. Long-term hydrographic and suspended sediment studies by the USGS, which Tom mentioned in his talk. Wet season water monitoring completed year two of a three-year pilot study. Sediment samples were collected in the deep bay, near field, and margins areas. Our partners at Moss Landing Marine Labs were crucial to getting those near field and margin sediment samples collected, as well as the prey fish monitoring samples. We partnered with the Marine Mammal Center and samples were collected for the first year of a two-year pilot study to look at toxic contaminants in harbor seals. And lastly, we had our dry season water crews. The sturgeon sampling, sediment crews, and water crews are in bold because I'm gonna share a little more about how those efforts went. Fish were hard to find this year, but we caught some. <laughs> Our goal was to collect samples from 30 fish. We ended up with 12 after four, four full days of fishing. And those fishing events were spaced about one or two weeks apart. And that happened in March and April of this year. Um, pictured here is one of those 12 fish we were able to catch over the four days. I'm pictured here with my predecessor as RMP manager, Melissa Foley. Melissa hasn't left the RMP completely. She, um, she has been an incredible help to me in my first year as RMP manager and is still involved in some of the RMP projects. I don't have a lot of experience fishing. I didn't grow up fishing, but I was excited to get there out there and try it. Melissa is really good at fishing. Uh, she even looks cool doing it. <laughs> um, so she, uh, Melissa knows how to fish. I needed a lot of help. Um, in past years, we had partnered with uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife for our sturgeon sample collection, but since the pandemic, they were no longer able to help collect samples for us, so we had to find another way, and we were fortunate to make a new friend to the RMP with Gatecrasher Fishing and Captain Zach Medinas. Captain Zach is pictured in the middle top uh, there helping to um, measure a fork length of one of the sturgeon we had collected. Captain Zach Medinas, friend to sturgeon and the RMP, very passionate and knowledgeable about sturgeon in the bay. Um, he only does catch and release and, align, and this really aligns with our non-lethal sampling techniques that we are doing. You can see in the picture of Martin uh, with one of the fish he caught up there in the upper right, uh, the arrow points to the, the area where we sampled uh, the fish for uh, muscle tissue using a muscle plug. It looks a little bloody, but they don't always get that bad. But you can see it's just a very small um, 
It's a very small sample. Captain Zach also tagged all the fish we collected or we caught and um, sampled, and he said he would let us know if they were, how they were doing if they were ever recaptured. On to our sediment cruise. Every five years, the RMP monitors contaminants and sediment. This was the first sediment cruise since the s and redesign and its new focus on emerging contaminants. As such, the cruise was planned to only sample in the central, south, and lower south sub-embayments and included collecting samples for PFAS and bisphenols. One of my fir first challenges was finding us a vessel to use. In 2018, the sampling was conducted from the RV turning tide. Unfortunately, that ship was not available for us to use this year. So I reached out to a friend from my old uh, Romberg Tiburon Center days, Alex Parker, who informed me that the RV questuary could be chartered from the Golden Bear Research Center at Cal State Maritime Academy. So pictured in the upper right is another new friend to the RMP, Nick Shields, who skippered the questuary for our deep base sediment crews. And in this image, which is the cover of the RMP update, we see Stephen Keelar pictured here operating the winch. And also from, he's also from Golden Bear Research Center and a new friend to the RMP. In the green jacket is Jennifer Doherty, who I introduced at the beginning, one of our new faces at the RMP. And on the left, although you cannot see his friendly face, is Paul Salop of AMS, a longtime partner and friend of the RMP who worked with us for the sediment cruise. Here are a couple more action shots from the sediment cruise. Maybe you will recognize the man on the very left as SFEI, SFEI's very own Don Yi. <laughs> Here's Don flexing his muscles, mixing up a composite sediment sample on the left, and then on the right, chatting it up with Paul from AMS. In all, we collected 229 sediment samples over four days, and our next sediment cr cruise is scheduled to occur in 2028. All right, now on to the water cruise. The water cruise was originally scheduled for August 28th through September 1st, but we were delayed multiple times due to the point, or to the point where I was starting to think that the cruise was actually cursed. Um, I had been sending emails all the time trying to inform the labs and our partners and our team to let them know when we might actually be able to, to get started. And I was ready to start a newsletter that I was going to call the latest cruise news, which was the subject line of all of my emails. So as the boat was transiting to Redwood City on the weekend before the cruise was set to start, the engine broke. Parts were hard to come by and repairs took 24 days, which in hindsight really wasn't that long, but it felt long in the, in the, at the time. When we were finally able to get started on September 21st, it was one of those super smoky days when the smoke had blown in from the wildfires in the north. And um, I could have taken that as a bad omen, uh, but smoky skies this time of year have sadly become sort of normal. And then we were hit with a plague. <laughs> um, so uh, that was after we had completed two days of the cruise. Um, and so then we were delayed for another five days to be, uh, which, which was recommended by the CDC. Luckily, the virus did not spread and we were able to restart again on September 28th. And that's when it gets really fun. So just sit right back and you'll hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip. It started from a Richmond port aboard this tiny ship. The mate was a mighty sailing man, the skipper brave and sure, Four scientists set sail that day for a six hour tour, <laughs> a six hour tour. The ocean started getting rough. The tiny ship was tossed. If not for the courage of this fearless crew, well, you know the rest. <laughs> we did not end up on a deserted island, but we did spend a couple hours adrift in the Pacific Ocean. As we were leaving our first station, BC-20, uh, a historic station located approximately seven miles outside of the Golden Gate. Um, we had finished our sampling and we were transiting to the second sampling station of the day. A sound like tinfoil in the wind uh, was heard and smoke started coming from the engine pit. A shredded timing belt was found and coolant was linking where it was not supposed to. 
Um, so we ended up only not being, or we ended up only being able to sample one station that day, but I think we somehow that day managed to break the curse. Four days later, the boat was fixed, yay! And we got back on the water and were able to complete our sampling plan with only one or two minor hiccups. There's a couple shots from that day. Um, Martin, I wanna, Martin's up there a couple times, me, <laughs> Ezra. And then we were able to sample 22 stations in total distributed across all five bay segments. Uh, six of those stations were fixed, one in each of the Sassoon, San Pablo, Central, South Bay, and Lower South Bay, and an additional station in the Lower South Bay. Um, and then the remaining 16 st stations were selected randomly. We collected more than 300 liters of water, and that uh, filled about 435 samples, which have now all been shipped off to the labs for analysis, and we're anxiously awaiting the results. <laughs> I want to acknowledge all the many different people and groups that we partner with to make the ST monitoring program a success this year. Lots of friends, new and veteran. I'm sure there's, I'm sure I've maybe inadvertently missed someone, and all the SFEI staff who also help make all of our efforts come together. So for 2024, our plan is to continue the long term hydrographic and suspended sediment studies by the USGS. Uh, we'll be measuring toxic contaminants in wet in water during the wet season as the third year of our pilot three-year pilot we'll look at selenium in clams water and sturgeon toxic contaminants in bird eggs sport fish and harbor seals harbor seals will be year two of the pilot of that and that's all i got so thank you So I'm going to invite Jay up here and Tom and Amy and is someone to help run mics. Yes. I guess got to turn on. Is there a button? Uh, I'm going to start. Amy, I have a question or a, po a point. I like fishing. And, and perhaps there's a role I might be able to play to help in the future. <laughs> so I'm sure that, are there any questions online first? Okay. We cannot have stumped you. We have the historian, the newbie, another historian. Jay didn't do the presentation, but he's also been part of the RMP from the start. Um, Questions. Come on, guys. There you go. I just have a comment because for some reason the broadcast is not there. Let's see what happens. Probably not. <laughs> you, we thought that too. We're like, hmm. You need to use the mic, otherwise, I can't hear you online. So I, I wanted to. Uh, something I did because I just was cognizant of not, uh, not uh, keeping on time. I didn't call out a lot of a lot of people that I would have liked to, and I can't go down that list right now. But I, uh, but I want to tell you a lot of what I everything I talked about. You can find background information on the RMP website. Jay's done a great job actually compiling the history, some of the historical documents. And I would shout out to the. Uh, I would get you if you're interested. Read the 2017 Pulse. There's a great story there that Jay authored on the hist at that point the 25 year history of the RMP, which complements a lot of what I said today. So there's this. Then uh, the new redesign I can say from practice is is really much user friendly and it's relatively easy well we want you to tell us is it easy enough to find information if not communicate to us so we can make it better we have a question up there Be wait before oh. before the question i want to make a comment and add to the history a little bit i'm a little anecdote about when i first met tom and uh i joined the institute before it was sfei as tom mentioned it was the aquatic habitat institute in 1986, and my first big assignment was to work on a report on the loading of toxic contaminants to the bay, and I was in charge of the chapter. Gonna turn this off, I, think. I was in charge of the chapter on wastewater loading, and so I needed to go to the water board. These this was before digital information, 
I needed to go to the water board to look in their files to dig up hard copy, uh, uh, hard copy of the reports that the dischargers were submitting back then. It took me to some dark and scary places. Um, <laughs> One in particular I'm thinking of is the basement of the old building on Jackson where the where the older files were kept and people hung their sweaty jogging clothes. So that was kind of scary down there. But um, as part of that, I needed to talk to Tom because Tom was in, um, in charge of the refinery permits at that time. And um, Tom, in contrast, had all of his files very handy. It was easily easy, easy to access uh, the files that Tom was working on, but even back then, Tom was demonstrating the qualities that we've benefited from so so much in the RMP. Um, th he had the refineries on a very progressive program of regulation, um, very proactive. He was showing great leadership with them and applying great intelligence to the to the um, permits that he was managing. Um, those same qualities he's carried through throughout his career. And, you know, as I've witnessed closely in the RMP, um, he's been as engaged and dedicated as any committee member of the RMP will ever be. Um, he showed today his incredible grasp of the program, which he could have given this talk off the top of his head. Uh, that's the, how engaged he is and uh, also how, how great of a mind he has. Um, he, he's a... Uh, he, he's um, got as firm a grasp on the program as me or Amy or any of the RMP management. Um, he's also been an excellent chair of the steering committee for the past 12 years. And over that time period, I'm wrapping up, wrapping up. Um, every decision has been made by consensus. So Tom talked about the spirit of collaboration and partnership that's been key to the, to the, to the program in water quality management in the, in the Bay. And uh, Tom has been a big part of that. So thank you, Tom. Well, thank you, Jay. And I, I particularly appreciate your recognition of my most excellent paper pile management skills. <laughs> we have a question up front top. Yeah, that's, that's up my alley. Um, we are absolutely continuing to monitor the archaic contaminants because um, the, uh, the tissue monitoring is really the, especially the fish tissue monitoring is really the, you know, the, the targets and the TMDLs are focused on, on fish tissue. Um, and it's, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're not seeing rapid trends, but uh, the trends need to be tracked and maybe at some point we will start um, seeing uh, clear, uh, clearly defined trends. So we're continuing to monitor all of those contaminants that you mentioned, PCBs, mercury, dioxins, pesticides, um, in addition to um, adding in the new contaminants that uh, are of rising concern. So I think we have time for one more question or two. Hello. Um, has there ever been monitoring or sampling after like event based sampling, such as after a earthquake or fire or something like that? Or could there be? I'll jump on that one. Uh, kind of, but yes, in the future. That's, we've actually made that a, a, we made a decision as part of the, this past year's discussion that to have money available for uh, responding to events, uh, partly inspired by the harmful algal bloom event from last summer, 
where we 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 actually redirected our sort of our nutrient science monies to respond to that. We actually had had to have actually we're out on the bay when remember for those of you who live in the Bay Area when we had the dark day from all the smoke a couple of years ago, we actually were able to be we're at monitoring some of the response of that. We've done some post fire monitoring a little minute amount, but the point is we haven't done much because that's not our typical that's not our bread and butter, but we we now have that in our radar in, in our vision that let's take advantage of these events when you have perturbations of a system, it gives you opportunity to understand how the system can respond and it'll prove our understanding of it. So you're part of the new vision. Thank you. Next question. Well, my public version or my uh, in the hallway version? No. Uh, it's, I, I, I very much appreciate it. I, I've been asked this question in various shapes, forms over for quite a while now as other players struggle with this. The Delta has, the Delta Regional Monitoring Program has its own challenge about how to establish sustained funding. Uh, of course, but they, they tend to have a lot more contentiousness up there, which gets in the way. So one thing though is, is the get funding is you get it, you got to get people on board to want to make it happen. And they, they, without that, you're not, you can't force it. You can only get, you can force it to only to an extent. I know in the, in the Russian River watershed, you for, you're fortunate, you do have Santa Rosa, who is, which is a, a fairly, fairly proactive community, but they're only one part of it. Uh, I, you know, I don't know what to say because like the, the pots of money just aren't there. Ideally, there would be more monies for these type of things in California through state funding as well as tapping federal funding. So, but what you got to do is build um, a foundation in your community and then find ways to put the nickels and dimes into the pass the hat around, so to speak. Uh, but if by the more you can get take progressive steps like we are fortunate here in the Bay Area that we we had a limited amount of state money but then it actually grew a bit because of the, the fortune of that Bay protection and toxic cleanup sort of surprise because without that it would have been a much bit more difficult struggle to to set things up um, I know you've got you've had that set up right so you have their foundation so now how do you sustain it because you can't well, you got to build partnerships with your vineyards and your and the recreational community, because those they are key stakeholders in in the modern that watershed as well as your main municipality. I'll talk to you some more about this. Um, I look forward to being an advisor for you as well. <laughs> trying to see if we have more time um i think oh we have one more question from eileen the other thing i want to um kudos to tom and also his and jay but the it's the people 
I mean, all the people in this room is the passionate of understanding the Bay it will be the finding the people that are passionate about the environment and Russian river is going to be key and then getting them out for drinks and then asking for their checkbooks. No, I'm serious. I mean, that's really what it is. So you have to have the people behind it that believe in it and then their, their checkbook will follow. Join me quickly. Cause I want, we're going to break, but breaks are a big, a key part of this event because we get dialogue going and it, unfortunately they, 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 they run, they go by fast, but we do have a block of time after the meeting to have fun together as we typically go over to the Jupiter. So those of you who can stick around, uh, there will be continued fun, but you're going <laughs> to back to. Go ahead, Eileen. And I was, get, I was actually breaking early because I love breaks. So we have more time for questions. <laughs> Well, thank you, Eileen. Um, the Pulse is really a big team effort, so it, the whole staff contributes to it. And we, um, I also want to mention that we just uh, t available today is the report that we put out every other year, the RMP update, which is an update on all the, the latest activities in the program. Um, it's kind of a lighter lift for us, um, so we put more, so we can put more effort into the Pulse every other year. Um, but that's available today on the RMP website. Um, so thank you for your feedback. It's very motivating. Um, part of the goal of the RMP, the goal statement, is to collect data and communicate information to support management. So we take that seriously. Uh, it's an outcome of one of the program reviews that uh, Tom mentioned earlier. Um, so Pulse is our primary vehicle for that. So it's really great to hear that feedback. Thank you. I got to speak up to the day definitely uh, is key to how well we've communicated and he has been very passionate continues to be in fact I I've struggled with trying to pull him back from spending so much time on his passion and because he, he touches so many things but that was part of the dialogue that we had about the pulse was a major is a game changer in our communication if you look at the annual reports up to that point they were boring <laughs> Yeah, but they were just a compilation of data. But then starting with the pulse, we started telling stories. Jay is a most excellent scientist writer, but there's a lot of other members of the team at the Institute, as well as collaborators who, who make that, that publication as good as it can be. But we did have to pull them back and say, rather than doing this every year, let's do it every other year. But he still puts a lot of attention to make that update a very valuable communication tool. So. Thank you so much, Jay, for that. And and, and, some, and I, I've been to essentially every one of these meetings that have ever occurred, and they've all been good. Um, and I know there are a lot of new faces here, but I'm going to shout out to, to Jim McGrath, because he was there at Ground Zero, because he, back then, he represented the, the ports and the dredgers. He was the environmental manager at the Port of Oakland. And but also comes came to the table with a lot of technical prowess, integrity, and and part of this collaborative spirit. You're one of the foundational players that helped us get get this off the ground and running. So I thank so much. And like he's still here, and uh, he's only a little bit older than me. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the other thing, Matt, I just thought about this is the key is part of how to get build your partnership as 
Karen, you brought attention to, is engage the, your community. And so you got to dedicate some resources to communication. And that's a, it's a tough one, but the, by communicating, you get people's interest. And one thing that we've been able to generate is a lot of collaboration through academic partnerships or partnerships with USGS. A key foundation, a lot of our new initiatives have been academics who come to us with ideas and can we piggyback on your cruise or do this and that? The microplastic work was an outgrowth of researchers from UC Davis coming to us and said, can we, come, can you, can you collaborate with us, help generate some samples from the Bay? I think our, our initial investment was 10, thousand dollars jay and you know that just that was just the putting our toe in the water for that big issue so um yeah that's part of the fun stuff that i've liked happen is building these partnerships with academics as well as the usgs scientists and the scientists amongst the regulated community we all get to know each other well and and we make things happen because we work together we have a question online don you want to take that or ask it Hi. Um, okay, so an anonymous attendee said, <laughs> the RMP also provides matching funds for obtaining grant money for a host of additional work that goes well beyond what the RMP can manage. Perhaps Tom can comment on some of that additional work that was notable. A couple ones that I just glanced over it, you know, I didn't even call attention to it due to the time that I, I showed near the end. A uh, picture of it, uh, I'm going to talk about nutrients, uh, sediment, and microplastics. That sediment thing was was the document recently produced, uh, uh, Sediment for Survival. That was an outgrowth of a San Francisco Bay Improvement Fund grant that needed matching funds that the RMP contributed to. But what and it gave us actually cause to talk about how do we go about uh, making decisions on providing matching funds and being cautious about not prematurely committing future year funding outside our governance structure where we set priorities and work together. But we make a point to associate match funds with work we already are planning to do or otherwise make sure we get value added. So that one, we committed funding on the condition that we would get a sediment monitoring strategy as an outgrowth of that, it gave us cause to fund and now continue to sustain the sediment work group. That's one. We just recently got a, a major grant, and Jay, you might may, may prefer to, you might have the details in your head better than me, but several million dollar grant from the US EPA San Francisco Bay Improvement Fund, where we are we're providing matching funds for that, but that addresses emerging contaminants, nutrients, sediment modeling and a huge leverage of our resources to like double down on that work and i and we're and we're very optimistic and hopefully the politicians in washington will get these vibes and it continue to to send money our way through sustained increases in the level of funding for the san francisco bay improvement fund which the this year is like over 50 million dollars and if it were to be sustained at that level, I mean, we, a dialogue that we can have some other time, but Luisa Valiela from US EPA is logically going to be running that program for as long as she's with EPA. And she's now working with us in terms of setting priorities for targeted use of those funds, which includes science support, whether you know, complementing the RMP, helping the evolution of the wetlands region monitoring program, helping us with nutrients, emerging contaminants. So that's just a snapshot of a number of things that we've done. The microplastic work is another bigger example because not only do we have that initial partnership with UC Davis, then, then the Estuary Institute staff get substantial funding from the Moore Foundation, but then we kind of did some matching of that as well. So if there's any, any thoughts that noteworthy that I missed, jump in. So I was gonna ask a question myself. So if you have a crystal ball what do you think is going to happen to the RMP in the next 30 years? <laughs> I normally cannot stump Tom, so I'm sure he has an answer. <laughs> well, I mean, next 30 years, we're just we're going to continuously be uh, at the forefront of recognizing emerging contaminants, building that into our system. We're going to continually to make 
generate data to inform decisions. So it's, it's staying the course. Perhaps we ideally we're going to get more funding so we can up the ante because we do, we are challenged now with more to do than we have funding for. And that's where we benefit from the, the supplemental environment project funding from Corn Water Board Enforcement. We really like the opportunity to get federal funding through the improvement fund. But what else? I, 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 I it seems to me it ain't broken, but we can just make it better. And, uh, and, uh, and maybe our, our, you know, I'm looking forward to uh, bigger parties, I guess. <laughs> Well, you know, I just want one last reflection because I, you, know, you inspired me, Eileen, because I do know that amongst you in the audience here are a number of our staff. And I, and I, I can tell you from my direct observation and engagement with them, we had a, we've got great staff at the water board. It's, it, it's it, lots of smart, young and now not so young people who are still engaged and passionate but really important is that we've the, the new we have a lot of a passionate new staff who've come to us who are going to be part of the future and so what's going to happen 30 years from now is my counterparts will be up here keeping the keeping the spirit alive and so and those are you in the audience you you, you. so thank you yeah, I have a quick addition to what Tom said about uh, 30 years from now. One is that we've built a foundation of a program that is solid and going strong after 30 years. So I think it's it's uh, nice to be able to to kind of assume that it will continue for 30 years. And it's thanks to the initial vision of Steve Ritchie and Mike and Tom and getting it started. But then the program has evolved and gotten stronger and stronger um, as the years have gone by. So just just you know, uh, acknowledging that that that's quite a quite a statement to be able to make that we think the program's going to continue, um, and then also um, there is a pulse. Um, I can't remember which year now, but um, maybe 2015, where we the theme was what what will the bay look like in 50 years, and there were great uh, contributions from Tom from Adam Oliveri, um, from Dave Sedlak. Um, so if uh, you're interested in more thinking about that topic, which I think is a great one, um, it's, that's a great resource to, to spur some ideas. I, I want to add one more thing, because I, I, I think I should have said this right off the top. In 50 years, we are going to be well well versed in preventing water quality problems and we're going to get past having to correct the problems that have been caused in the past so i think that's a, a key milestone we've uh, we're going to live with mercury and pcb contamination in the bay for quite some time but we're going to we're going to have done everything we can do to to enhance the base recovery of the legacy contaminants and we're going to do everything we can to prevent new contaminants becoming legacy so by in 50 years, I think we're going to have a, a, an active machine that keeps that we're always going to be our science is going to be ahead of the problem. And uh, so that's, we're going to be all be part of that. And maybe Amy will be retiring by about that. <laughs> all right, on that happy note. <laughs> Um, so we have a break until 1055. I urge you guys to make this opportunity to go talk to other people within the RMP network. This is really where the magic happens in terms of next steps. So thank you guys, 1055. Thanks, Tom and Jay and Amy.